This presentation is usually called Designing HTTP Interfaces in RESTful Web Services, but because we only have half an hour, it's only designing RESTful Web Services. I'm skipping through half of it. We're on slide three of 110. <laughs> so you won't need coffee this morning. Uh, my name is David. This is um, the dots over the name. You can spell it like this if you have one of the weird French keyboards that always freak me out. Uh, I'm from Munich, in, that's in Germany. I'll make that smaller because we're in France. And I work there as a founder of the company called uh, BitExtender. Still, like I'll start a new job in January. But I do or did web development technology, scalability, API, REST consulting things. Um, and this is my Twitter nickname. And we'll skip all the history of HTTP and the web and go straight to the point where Roy Fielding shows up, right? And says, here's this idea of REST. You've, you guys have all been doing SOAP, and people have been trying with you know, CRUD style stuff, etc. And people ignored that initially. And after a while, it, it, ca it caught on. Right? People said, man, REST, we have this REST thing now. And that was really, really great, because everybody could say, I have a REST API, when in fact, they didn't. Um, <laughs> because the problem was that nobody knew what they were really doing, and nobody ever looked at the, the background or the more finer details of REST. Right? Um, some of that has to do because it's not in his dissertation. I'll mention that later. But so we'll have to look at that term. I'll, forgive me if I pace like a tiger in a cage up and down. Okay, so you guys get some of my uh, attention as well. So REST is means representational state transfer, right? And the, so the most important aspect of it is already in the term. You transfer state of resources through their representations. That sounds trivial, but isn't actually. <clears throat> it's described in his dissertation, and. He defines a bunch of constraints. So it must be a client-server architecture, which to us web developers is kind of obvious, right? Stateless interactions. So a server, for instance, has no, there is no built-in protocol level concept of that is a subsequent request to an earlier one. In the web, we hack around this with cookies for session, with session IDs, etc. But that's a whole different story. Stuff should be cacheable, doesn't have to be. That's not a must, it's a should or may be cacheable, right? The cacheability is a direct consequence of the fact that it's a layered system. Layered system means that there is any number of intermediaries between the interaction of server and client, and these intermediaries are completely transparent to the communicating parties. That means I can have a caching proxy, I can have a caching reverse proxy somewhere on the path of communication, and nobody has to know about this. This, by the way, is one of the big problems with HTTP2 and Speedy. If everything's SSL by default, you can't do that anymore. And that hurts the scalability of the web, I think. Code on demand is completely optional. Best example would be JavaScript. We ship something to the client to enhance its experience, right? Executable code, forget that. At least for machines, it's not so interesting for APIs. And the last bit is the uniform interface. And the uniform interface is something people look at, and then they see, oh, something about status codes. Done. That's part Roy's fault. We'll, we'll, we'll look at why later. But the uniform interface basically says, you have a URL that identifies a resource. Okay? And then you use methods, it should be called some verbs, to perform operations on these. Right? And that operation is, should not be part of the URL, or doesn't have to be part of the URL. It's implicit from what you're doing. You delete the cup of coffee. You post to, you know, you get the product. Um, and then, and now it gets interesting, you use a hypermedia format to represent the data. Not just data, a hypermedia thing. And with link relations, clients can navigate through the service. And maybe even the server can figure out new things using link relations that he's programmed against. And Resource is important in the context of representations because a web page is not a resource. A web page is a representation of a resource, one of many representations that could be, right? So if you want to get the list of products as JSON, you get a list in JSON. If you want it as XML, you get it as XML. Now, neither application JSON nor application XML are hypermedia formats. They have no implicit meaning. I'll explain why later. But one hypermedia format that arguably is a bit special, there's a big, there, whenever you go to real REST conferences and then someone brings up HTML is not real hypermedia because it's not made for machines, it's for human browser things, and then a fight starts. It's like a guaranteed way to start a bar fight late in the evening at, at any REST conference uh, drink up. Because um, 
HTML is designed to, you know, it tells a browser what to display. I mean, it's, there's a semantic meaning attached to it, but com conveying that to machines is, some people do it, some people don't. I hate that, but that's just my opinion. So there is the same thing, the list of products in a hypermedia format, HTML, representing that in a speci specific way, in this case for human consumption through a web browser. And as you can see, this has a link here, and we can click that. And that brings me to a question for you guys. You don't have to answer it. I'll answer it for you, but <laughs> you get to think about it, okay? So the World Wide Web, what's, the World Wide Web is the first data exchange system on a, comp, like a, prop, on a proper planetary scale, right? And the question, and planetary scale, by the way, means it spans a planet. <laughs> That's what our, this is the Earth, our planet. It looks like this from space. But um, so how, how is that possible? Right? Because we have email, and email is a big application, but it, that doesn't count as a data exchange system because that's mailing stuff around, right? But to immediately access any sort of information, the web was the first one that grew that far. And the reason is because we have hyperlinks, right? Because a hyperlink, you can click, and there is no tight coupling between any of the things involved. If I, want to se if I send you, this half of the room, an email with the really important information for the drink of this evening, because there's going to be beers, I think, that's cool. You guys know this. And these guys go, they have to walk over to you, say, what's your email address, or can I send, give you my email address, and you send me that really important information? That doesn't work, right? But if I say, hey, here's a, here's a hyperlink, and click it, like imaginary click, the, OK? And then you, you guys follow the hyperlink. And that just works. And the hyperlink, um, the hyperlink has another con consequence, which is it's, it made the web loosely coupled by design, which is a very important design decision because, um, you know, it was invented at CERN, and they are egghead scientists. They could ha they could have said any link must have a link back because I'm linking from one paper to the other. And if I link to a paper, then that other paper must automatically or manually get another link back in its list of references because we need referential integrity. <laughs> right? And then you need a notification infrastructure saying, somebody wants to delete that paper, so the other papers need to remove the links first. The web doesn't have such a notification infrastructure because it would be completely ridiculous that if I want to link to google.com, I have to call them and ask them to put a link on the front page to my website. Right? Instead, we have a 404. It says, sorry, that's gone. And on a, on a fundamental level, it's built to embrace this, the possibility of failure. It doesn't even try to fix it because that works if you're within one company. You can have you know, one guy yelling at people for removing links on the wiki that point to wiki pages and stuff like this, but not if the whole plan is involved, like you'll start a war or something. So the web embraces failure fundamentally, and that's pretty cool, because one of the, one of the cool features about this is that we can add new things to this system, more information, without increasing the friction, right? So I mean. It'll get more difficult to find information as we add information, but there is absolutely no limit to the scalability of the World Wide Web. Because, I mean, you know, TCP, IP, et cetera, all these things, routing, they have a bunch of limitations. You need to design it carefully so it works. But HTTP and links is just a concept. You click something and it goes somewhere. And if in thousands of years we're on Mars and other planets and other solar systems, maybe because somebody invented warp drive, that would be cool, then. It'll st it would still work. I mean, there's going to be people that are like, this is so stupid, and everything's going to be JSON and web sockets, and it's, that'll be a failure, I can tell you right now. <laughs> but OK, we'll, we'll see. So the web has no limits to scalability, which is cool, because it's protocol-centric. And that gets me to hypermedia, because the uniform interface, right? We said we want to identify in resources through the URIs, and that they have conceptually separate representations. And we manipulate um, through representations, through complete, rep that's typo-ish. So you manipulate ideally through complete representations. There's this whole fight going on about a put can be partial, but ignore that. So, and all the messages are self-descriptive, right? So a server receiving a message from a client, maybe a put or post, has everything it knows from the contents of the message and the location and the verb. That's it. There's no out-of-band knowledge anywhere. 
And then we have to use, or want to use, hypermedia as the engine of application state. I think my battery is slowly dying. Hypermedia is the laser is. Laser beams are pretty cool. So hypermedia as the engine of application state is the thing we want to use to power the interactions okay, in, in, a, in a service. That's the magic awesome sauce, essential to REST. That that's what makes REST restful. If you don't have hyper, if you don't have HTTPS, which is a ter terrible term, then you, it's just HTTP. I'm sorry, it's just crud, right? Because most people call that GitHub's APIs, also Twitter. It's all just HTTP APIs. So, what we want, or what we, the questions we have to ask is, if we, how does a client even know how to interpret something, right? That's the first question. If the client has a list of, how does it do a next thing in a list of things? Like, it fetches a list of page resources, how does it go to the next page? Traditionally, we have, and this is so essential. Like, most people don't think about this, and then they, then they have some sort of shitty API with tie coupling. Like, if you remember SOAP APIs, I need to know that I need to call create product with a bunch of parameters, right? And that gives me a product that creates a product on the server. And it returns an ID, which is a long. And then I need to pass that ID to get product when I want to retrieve that product. That is so much out of band information that's hidden in some sort of documentation. That's bad, because that, you, can't ever, you can never change that. You can never say, oh, it's going to be a different format now, or you get it, you fetch it from another service, maybe. It's not possible, right? So the whole evolvability thing, like, how do we even fetch the next page? Like everyone who's ever tried to do pagination in SOAP knows how hard that is. Mm -hmm. So that, right? Then how do you even create a new category? Where and how and what does it look like? Where's the whole contract for the service? Now people might say, hold on a second, Whistle is a contract. It's not. Whistle, all Whistle files for SOAP services do is they define the object structures and the method signatures. But they don't tell you that you need to cr call create product before you can go get, call, get product. Or some, I've seen SOAP APIs where you need to call an initialize method and you get back a J conversation ID from the stupid JBoss server and you need to send that along in a cookie along with a request that you send over HTTP. It's like mind-blowingly mm, idiotic almost. So, and that's what hypermedia is the engine of application state solves, right? We have, uh, we have links, so clients and servers, even servers. I've, I've written hypermedia apps where servers followed links from the clients to gather stuff. So people could send data, and that data was defined by metadata, but the server would fetch the metadata themselves. So the client wouldn't have to say, OK, I upload the metadata first, and then I can reference it in the data I push to you. Pfft, not necessary. Much easier for both, both sides. Um, you use link relations to express these options. So instead of saying, I know what the, so I have a product and that contains a category ID, and now I know that I attach the category ID to some sort of URL prefix to fetch that category resource, you simply have a link pointing to a category, and it has a link relation name called something something category, and a client and a server know that. And then they follow the href, and that takes them to the category. Done. Right? A lot simpler. No URL construction, ideally, at least. Um, so these URLs can also change from users on the server side because the clients don't have to know them in advance. And that, to some, to some extent anyway, abstracts the whole application workflow. Right? And the, the, it, that's important, and it all works because a hypermedia type has to find meaning for its content. So servers and clients have a common understanding of what the product element means, what the price inside it means, how to interpret these things, right? So you say there is an availability element. If it's false, you must not sell that thing. Done. That's defined in the type. And clients are written against that thing, so they understand this. Easy. You can add new elements over time if you want to without breaking stuff. I'll get to versioning in a moment. And so that leads to the communicating parties having a common understanding. And once you have a common understanding, everyone knows what the format looks like and knows the link relations. That's all you need. And then all you need to give a client is, here's the entry point to that service, nothing else. You don't have to say, to create a new product, you post to a resource called, a location called slash product slash dollar ID, something, something, something. Like many API documentations have, right? It's, technically, it's not necessary. So I've earlier had an example with application XML. All application XML as a media type means, it's a soup of, come on, pointer. 
It's a soup of angle brackets with defined parsing rules, right? So now, now some people rock up and say, oh, XML is stupid. Let's use application JSON. And application JSON is just a soup of curly braces <laughs> with no attempt semantic meaning. Um, they're just both serializations. And all they say, all they tell you is how to parse the basic format, but not how to understand the contents, right? So we want semantics. We want a meaning attached to these element contents. Some people use Atom, et cetera. I have my own problems with that. And for this example, I'm going to just uh, not going to use Atom or XHTML, but roll my own custom hypermedia type. We'll call it Acme shop, because it's acme.com shop XML. So this is V and D dots. So nobody from the IANA yells at me for you know cluttering the global namespace. So if you call it application slash V and D dot something, you can make up your own words. That's fine. There's some people who disagree, I think, but I don't care. Like, so you shouldn't care either. Should just do this, right? And then plus XML tells you it's based on application XML. So the underlying parsing rules of application XML apply, but the meaning attached to it is your custom thing. So there's our product. And we have we reuse atoms for the link elements, and there's a price, there's a name, there's an ID. And uh, the payment is a defined link relation. So the word payment. You've seen link relations like next, prev, alternate, self, link rel self, right? Those often show up even in HTML documents. Um, if you want your own link relations, like a category, you can't just, you shouldn't just put category in there. Call it like HTTP colon slash slash yourcompany.com slash rel slash something to avoid collisions in the future, right? We're also being like really nice HTTP citizens. This has nothing to do with REST or hypermedia technically. We're telling a client immediately that this location to this product, you can get, put, and delete. Helpful. Um, XML is really good for such a thing. So I prefer XML for hypermedia uh, types, at least in the initial phases of development, because you have hyperlinks, namespacing, attributes, and a completely different uh, a completely different uh, document structure than JSON. Um, JSON doesn't have a bunch of these things, but more importantly, so first of all, people say JSON is harder to read and write, which is nonsense in my opinion. So this is just a rant, little rant against JSON. I like it for many cases, but not for all. JSON is not easier to write or debug than XML, because if you leave a comma or a curly brace somewhere in the 500 megabytes of JSON, no parser can tell you what the problem is. Right? So this is not more human readable, because if you have a comma here, or if you forget that comma, it just breaks. And for a human, that's a lot harder to spot, actually, than missing angle brackets. Um, what I did here is I have an idea, I have a name. And because I was anticipating there to be many links, I put it into an array of objects, right? So I was trying to be smart about the future, because I knew, aha, there's not going to be just one link. We'll have many links. So I'll make it an array immediately. And that gets us to something that gets problematic over time. So say I want to add a currency attribute to the price. right? In XML, I can just do that, because the node value of this element stays the same. Any code out there that's written to parse this price, this, uh, this old thing, and read the price, if I add an attribute here, it won't break. Because the element content is still 3.14. But any code that's written to read um, the float 3.14 from the price field in JSON will break once I change that to an object and I give it an amount and a currency field. Right? So I need to have, keep the old price around and have a new prices array, etc. So evolving JSON over time is difficult. And that has to do with, because XML is built for exactly this kind of extensibility. Its, it's, it's document model had, allows for mixed content and repetition of elements without changing the structure. So you can have this. You can, have, you can sell bacon for $5.99, right? And then inside that document, you can just arbitrarily express your love for bacon by saying om nom nom bacon. And that doesn't break anything. And then you can have a currency attribute on that. That doesn't change anything. Still, no client breaks. I add a second price element, still no client breaks. Because no client can say, give me the price in product. Every client in XML must say, give me the first price element in product, regardless if there's one or two or three. right? 
So I can keep adding elements because the boss walks in and says, we're going international now. So in addition to the old US dollar price that we also mark up now as US dollar, and it's the first, so no old code breaks, we want to start selling in euros. And then you can start translating stuff. You keep the original English first, so no old stuff breaks, and then you translate it to speck in German. What is bacon in, uh, in French? It's not chambon, right? Bacon. Is it bacon? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that would have been a bad example. <clears throat> and starting links, etc. Repeating elements, mixed content is important for evolvability over time. So, yeah. A good example is the Love Film API. Has, is anybody here a Love Film subscriber? One, two, three. So it's a DVD rental service, right? Um, <clears throat> It's kind of a good example. It's not perfect, but it's good. So here you see we're listing, we, we, we searched for old in the games catalog. Okay? This interaction was started probably through some sort of form or URL template. So maybe even you could embed maybe an HTML form in there with an action and a bunch of fields, and it has a relation. So a client sees the games catalog, and at the bottom of the games catalog, there is an HTML form. And any client knows that form because it has a specific name, right? And says, ah, that's the search form. And it understands a bunch of fields, so it knows how to submit it. It just appends the URLs, the, the things, the fields by question marks, like a browser would, submits that. Or you use a URL template, or you use X forms or something else, right? So now we're looking for old. We're on page one. That's self. So we know where we are. That's actually quite useful because if this document is you know, internally in the client or server delegated to through code, through code, through code, through code, then at some point you'll end up in code that doesn't even know what the URL was for the bit of XML or JSON it's handling right now. So including self-links is always useful. And there's a next link here that takes us to the next page. You see, it starts at start index 2, and the last page is start index 6. So if I now want to build a robot that, in, that just scrapes all these products, all these catalogs in the game, in, in the, all these games in the catalog, I'll build a while loop that follows a next link and fetches everything in the page until there is no more next link. Done. I don't have to understand the uh, total results, items per page, take the current URL, replace start index 1 with 1 plus 6 divided by the number of pages. Really? That's a lot easier. You just follow the next link. So simple. Why did nobody have that idea before, right? In SOAP, we would have to do exactly this, the maths with this stuff. And then here's just one title, right? And this has an ID. This really, in my opinion, should be a link rel equals self. Self doesn't mean the current page. Self means whatever the current element is I'm in, right? So if you have a link rel self here, then it refers to the catalog title, whether in XML or JSON. That's the usual convention you do for this. So I can write some sort of while loop you know, to index everything. And it cuts out the catalog title and delegates that to some other code. And that code, through looking at the ID or a link rel self, then knows where that thing is located. So it could store that along in the database so it could re refresh it periodically. Right? That's useful. And it has a ratings, etc. And here you see a bunch of links. And they use their own relations for stuff like synopsis or reviews. Because self and next and last are universally accepted link relations. They're in a list maintained by the IANA. But reviews is not a generic term that applies to every API. So reviews is custom to love them. That's why they gave it their own namespace, basically, right? to avoid naming collisions with other APIs that also have reviews. And any client can now follow that reviews link to fetch the reviews. Now, as this company is owned by Amazon, Amazon could tomorrow decide that they will move the location of the reviews to something called api.amazon.com slash something, something, something. And instead of be pulling the reviews for Knights of the Old Republic from Love Films database, they could pull them from Amazon's database. And no client would even know. Right? There is some issues with authentication, maybe, etc. But any client who wants the reviews for this title just figures out what link has the rel reviews and follows the href. So if the href changes tomorrow because they change, decide to power them from another source because it's Amazon, no problem. That's forward compatibility. Um, it uses application XML. That's bad, because 
for content negotiation and a bunch of other cases, you know, there's no meaning, so they should have their own media type theoretically. Um, and all the links also don't say what type is on the other side, so any link should always have a rel, an href, and ideally a type. So a client knows that it understands the type on the other side. It doesn't use XML namespacing, etc., but that's just a technicality. Um, another good example, mainly before, because for its documentation, is Huddle. I'll upload these slides, by the way. Um, so Huddle has a really nice documentation where um, they have uh, they have a documentation for the media type and they have a documentation for the link relations, and that's it. They don't tell you the structure of URLs or anything else, right? They use thumb and pa like avatar, etc., in the link relations. That th that's not ideal, but uh, yeah. So. Again, some evolvability things, but a good starting point if you want inspiration. Now, I'm slowly running over time. I started three minutes later. <laughs> so I get three more minutes? That's the reason why I just let you five minutes more. I get five minutes more? That's good. Then I can finish, maybe. So, versioning. I'll do this really quickly. Let's assume, well, why, do we want, why shouldn't you have V1 and V2? Because many people do that for version 1 and version 2 of the API. So the first answer is you should try to never break compatibility. Unless your business, unless your business model changes drastically, it's probably not necessary to have backwards compatibility changes. Twitter has backwards compatibility changes because they're idiots. That's, like, that's, that's honestly why I have to say this. Their initial API was so bad, that's why they have to break stuff. But so one, the first problem is different URLs technically mean different resources to, to proxies, intermediaries, clients, etc. And maybe a machine would like to bookmark something as well, right? I want to remember the location of that product, and over time I get updated to a newer version to, of the protocol, and I want to fetch the same product using a newer version of the API. So imagine in version one, I fetch a product and I get it, okay? I get it back, that's it. Now. The product sells out because the red staplers for 3 years 14 bargain, completely popular. Everybody buys them. They're gone, right? So it sells out. And now if we fetch it, we get a 404. Because that's the find meaning. There is no indicator of availability in the product in version 1 of the API, right? So what we can't do is now simply add a field availability to the API. Because if you f fetch version 2 of the API and you get availability, right, false, telling clients to never sell this, that's fine because they're explicitly f f requesting version 2. And version 2 has a definition saying there is an availability flag, you must obey it. But if this were version 1, we couldn't do that because a client expects that if it's not a 404, I can sell it, right? So this would be an example for when you need to version. And then if you, you do it through the media type, you could do it in such a way that someone who wants version 2 gets the product back, even though it's, though it's out of stock, but it says so. And if a client says, I want version 1, he still gets a 404. Bam, versioning works. There and there. So versioning through media type instead of URL allows you to upgrade protocols for known URLs. Um, or imagine like PHP, BB, Drupal, WordPress, all these you know, really popular CMSs, et cetera, the open source things. Imagine they had APIs. They don't for the most part, but imagine they did. Now, if clients want to support all possible WordPress or PHP BB installations in the world, they need to know what the structure of the URLs is with the slash API, slash v1, and stuff like this, and they need to start regexing, because one of the sharks forms, sharks, laser beams, you get the idea, right? So sharks have that has API v1, the other one has API v1 directly under the root, and they need to start regexing to figure out is it version 1 or version 2 of the API I'm, I'm looking at, etc. That would be bad. And if another forum software then, you know, a commercial forum software comes and says, I want to use that same API, they also have to have v1 in their URLs. That's really not clever, right? So don't have this tight coupling with the v1 and v2. Your eye-based versioning, remember, kills interop. Now, you might be wondering, because I've talked a lot about forward compatibility, interoperability, etc. Isn't there, what, is that all? Like, because the merits of REST seem to be, 
it's easy to evolve, right? We've seen that, ideally, without backwards compatibility breaks. You can add stuff. It's actually really easy to learn for developers. You have a defined media type. You have link relations. And somebody gives you an entry point to the URL. And then you, as developers, we can all use curl to go to the entry page. And we see links. And we follow them by curling the next location. And that's why how we jump through the API and figure it out. It's really easy to learn. Um, and easy to scale because it grows with the number of participants. Someone else can adopt the same media type, and bam, they're instantly compatible. And then you get all the HTTP stuff, right? It's content negotiation, the whole authentication part, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Conditional requests saying update that only if it's not been changed. So if you just do an HTTP thing, right? Screw hypermedia, just do nice status codes, and then you get authentication TLS, all the cool parts. It's really scalable. You can put a proxy in between to cache it. Is that, if that's all that there is, it's like, if that does the job, is there nothing else about REST that, that is worthwhile? It's, there must be one killer feature, right? In addition to just evolvability and future proofness. And the answer is no. So Roy himself, and so there's two interesting, there's one or two interesting topics or articles on Roy's blog that kind of finish off his dissertation. Because in his dissertation, he doesn't talk enough about hey to s and link relations. But he has, he has a really angry post up about, I'm so sick of people and everyone and get off my lawn and uh, nobody uses hypermedia and every REST API must use hypermedia. He gets really angry. Uh, because nobody understands it, because it wasn't in his dissertation, right? He says it's on the scale of decades, and it's, it's directly opposite to short of efficiency. And it's, REST is focused on long-term evolvability over time, right? So that's the difference. Um, further reading, if you're interested, uh, how I explained REST to my wife is a conversation that quickly goes from who's that guy, Roy Fielding, to, you know, stuff like, it's fun. It's interesting like, as an entry, entry point. How to get a cup of coffee models the Starbucks ordering flow um, as a RESTful web service. It's really useful, because you guys all know to order coffee at a coffee place. Um, his dissertation, ideally don't try to read it in the evening, because it has some boring parts in it. I always fell asleep until I tried it in the morning with a cup of coffee. Um, and three books on REST. Oh, I'll upload these slides. Don't worry. Um, I'll tweet the slide link, and you can download them. That's PDF. Uh, Rest in Practice is the book I, w I would recommend if you want to learn more about this. It takes you from early mistakes with XML and SOAP step by step to hypermedia. Restful Web Services Cookbook has some advice I don't agree with, like URL based versioning. This is an older version of Leonard Richardson's book, Restful Web Services. He's currently writing a newer, um, a newer version, a second edition, together with Mike Amundsen. It's going to be kick ass, so maybe wait for the new edition, and that will be the end.